our next speaker. Welcome to the latecomers. You missed a really good talk, but there are six more to come. So, um, Our next speaker started in France. He took 11 months to travel 32,000 miles circumnavigating the planet. Why did he do it? He did it for microfinance. Please welcome to the stage Mathieu Tordeur, who drove around the world for microfinance. Don't worry, there's just support notes I'm not going to read out. Um, so good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, first of all, for having me uh, here in the Royal Geographical Society. Before I tell you all about my driving skills, I would like to start off with an inspirational quote from Muhammad Yunus. Muhammad Yunus was the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize recipient for his works on microfinance. In my experience, poor people are the world's greatest entrepreneurs. Every day, they must innovate in order to survive. They remain poor because they do not have the opportunities to turn their creativity into sustainable income. And this quote stayed in my mind for a bit of time, and it, it inspired me to go on an adventure, to go meet these people, to try to support them, and try to un unleash the, the, this potential he's talking about. So after my second year at university in 2013, I took a gap year and I embarked in an 11-month journey around the world with my childhood friend, Nicholas, here. And after some common travel together, we both knew we wanted to travel with a purpose and be self-sufficient in terms of transportation. So what we did is that we opted for the most ridiculous French car we could think of, <laughs> a 30-year-old Renault 4. But the French uh, like to call it the 4L. So I will say 4L sometimes. Um, and we, de we decided to support poverty elevation through microfinance. So in, I'm not an economist, I am not a microfinance specialist. So we've teamed up with world class microfinance organizations based in France called Babylon and Entrepreneur du Monde. We've managed to fundraise £20,000 through private and public institutions, and we've redistributed that money. Uh, under the form of microcredits to people excluded from the formal financial sector. Um, then our partners would put us in contact with uh, microfinance institutions based abroad in Asia, in Africa, in South, Central and South America, as well as in Africa. So there we were. Our goal was to drive all around the world and to meet these people we would have, we would have supported with microcredits and to share their stories. Now, it is a hard task for me to speak of such a life-changing trip in, in on, only 10 minutes. Um, but what, what I will do for the next seven minutes is to tell you a few stories. And the first story happens in India. After just 8,000 miles through Europe, Turkey, and Iran, um, the car started, unfortunately, to, to show signs of wear and tear. And you need to know that Nicholas and I are both rubbish at fixing cars. And but clearly, when you hold a piece of your suspensions in your hand, you know something is wrong. Um, <laughs> and for some inexplicable reasons, uh, you will see that my friend is smiling, which is very weird. Um, but this time, the rear suspensions of our mighty 4L had unfortun unfortunately snapped. And that happened in the outskirts of Kolkata in India. So quickly, we've managed to found, find a workshop and the chief mechanic told us they would be done in two hours, um, but we were a bit suspicious, um, and we were right to be, because this two hours wait transformed into a four hour wait, then an eight hour wait, and we ended up sleeping the night there in the waiting room of the garage. But the next day, the suspensions were sort of fixed, and we had a few surprises on our way to Kolkata. Uh, the first one was when my friend Nicholas tried to fill up the tank of the car and all the fuel splashed in his shoes uh, because the fuel pipe had been broken. But more interestingly, um, when we have cleaned up the interior of the car, I found a metallic part under the front passenger seat, and this metallic part was part of the suspensions. So there you go. Always check that your mechanic is not hiding parts of your car under your seats, that he has no idea how to put back together. <laughs> India was also the country where we started our microfinance operations. And you need to know that 
microfinance, uh, first of all, is not charity. Um, the micro-entrepreneurs are charged uh, an interest rate, but that interest rate is solely used to cover the running costs of the microfinance institutions. They are not used for profit. So what happens when a person wants a micro-credit? There is to create or to develop an activity, let's say a small restaurant or a sewing workshop. Um, an employee of a microfinance institution would go and meet that person, try to assess his or her needs, that come, then come back to the branch and uh, study the case, and then the microcredit would be granted or not granted. But it doesn't stop there, and that is why the, the work of the social microfinance institutions is truly remarkable, um, because the micro-entrepreneurs have to understand how to make the best out of their microcredit, and to do so, the the micro, the, they provide compulsory trainings, and these trainings, they take the form of role plays or little games, and they are very effective. India was also the last country for the car in Asia, because unfortunately we couldn't cross overland to Burma, the next country, so what we did is that we shipped the car to the US, uh, to California, and ourselves we flew to Southeast Asia, to Cambodia and Vietnam, to do some more microcredit operations there. Six weeks later, we were reunited with our car, showing off in front of the Golden Gate Bridge, ready to drive south through Mexico, Central and South America, all the way down to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And by this stage of the trip, I had a fair bit amount of experience in driving in different countries. But Bolivia was like nothing else. We've deliberately spent three days in the Salar de Uyuni, a gigantic salt flat, and the driving experience there was actually a bit like sailing, because to go from point A to point B, we would use a compass and try to stick to the course if we didn't know, did not want to drive in circles. And there was no sense of perspective, nor landmarks. So the experience was really amazing. And at night, the sky would be so clear that we would be gazing at the stars and the Milky Way as long as we could cope with the, with the cold. Because when I took that picture, it was minus 15 degrees, and Nicholas was casually lying in the tent, uh, as you can see. To get out of South America, we've managed to board on a massive cargo ship with our car. And it wasn't a luxurious ship, as you can see. There was no windows. But still, there was a little swimming pool attached at the back of the boat. And we would spend most of the days just gazing, um, looking at the sea, sometimes with the GNT in hand, trying to spot other ships with binoculars. And we, def we would definitely see seagulls and flying fishes. We even once even saw a floating piano. Uh, which was interesting, um, but with no, with no players attached, I'm afraid. Um, and, um, and then two weeks later, uh, after crossing the Atlantic, we've, uh, we've eventually disembarked in Dakar, in Senegal, in West Africa. And that was the last leg of our journey. For the first time, we would be heading back up north to Europe, and on our way, we've met with this man, Amafu, in Morocco. And a few years back, this man was working uh, in the carpentry, but he was making little profit. So what he did is that he came close to a microfinance institution in Morocco and got a 500 euro loan on, over a pe period of 12 months. He used that money to rent a, a workshop of his own and started to work for himself. And now he's doing very well. He has an interesting uh, commercial business strategy that pays off. Uh, he collects uh, catalogs from IKEA and tries to reproduce the exact same furniture. Um, but his customers love it, and he does well. And when we left him in July 2014, he told us that he was about to employ an apprentice. So the question you might be asking, asking yourself now is, does microcredit actually work then? And the answer is that there is a vast amount of microfinance institutions around the world, and that they do not work all the same, that is for sure. But believe me, when the micro-entrepreneurs are accompanied in the credit process, then the reimbursement rate come, comes close to 99%. During our trip, we've ended up meeting with 50 micro-entrepreneurs. We've supported 150, um, and 90% of them were women. We've ended up driving 30, through 40 countries uh, on five continents for a total of 32,000 miles. And now that I came back, um, I brought back countless memories of tenacious and courageous men and women working super hard to improve the living conditions of their families, always with a big smile on, 
and their attitudes, their ambitions, and their strength of character to uh, never give up was very touching, and I feel humble to have met them. Thank you very much.